Thanks for joining us for this archive of Ashbrook and Teaching American History's special webinar for Wednesday, December 8th, 2021. The focus of today's program was Forgotten Heroes of World War II. We were joined by Dr. Jeff Sikinga, Professor of Political Science at Ashland University, and Dr. John Moser, Professor of History at Ashland University, and they discussed these 10 American heroes of the Second World War, all awardees of the Medal of Honor, and their individual stories and uh, giving us an opportunity to think about uh, who they were, what they did, and why they are worth remembering. Thanks for joining us. I want to welcome everybody to this uh, we webinar of the Ashbrook Center. Uh, special uh, welcome on this 80th uh, the day after the 80th anniversary, of course, of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And uh, a special welcome in particular to all our veterans out there who are joining us. Today, we, I wanted to, to talk to connect to that theme uh, of Pearl Harbor Day. I wanted to talk today about um, the Great War. <laughs> Not the First World War, but the, the Second World War. The, uh, war that really defined so much of America, in American history in the 20th century, but of course has continued in many ways in its effects to define America's place in the world even now in the 21st century. And this webinar is put on by the Ashbrook Center and we wanna welcome citizens from around the country who are joining us, students who are joining us, and of course teachers joining us through teachingamericanhistory.org. Welcome to all of you. This is a conversation today, and as always with Ashbrook, we believe profoundly in the power of conversation. We believe that education is not simply about information and definitely not about indoctrination, but about discovering the truth for yourself. As I always say, we root all of our programs in Aristotle's old maxim that all human beings by nature desire uh, to know but we add, they don't wanna to be told, they wanna to discover it. And we found that discovering the truth through conversation is really the best way to do it. So we're gonna have a conversation today on heroes from World War II and the meaning of heroism and what it shows us about the American character. Joining us today in that conversation is our old friend, Old in the sense that he's been with us a while, not, not the other sense, of course. <laughs> I'm old in that sense too. Now, fair enough. <laughs> our, our old friend, uh, Dr. John Mosier. John is the chair of the Department of History and Political Science at Ashland University. He is the chair of Ashbrook's Master of Arts in American History and Government graduate program and um, a, a teacher in our student programs, in our Teaching American History seminars. He's done many of those, for example, I think out on the USS Midway in San Diego. Uh, he's a tremendous expert in World War II. Those of you who have joined us in previous uh, webinars with John on World War II know that he has a, an encyclopedic knowledge of that great conflict. He teaches courses on World War II for us in the undergraduate program. He teaches classes on 20th century American and international history. He is a prolific author. He's authored several books on 20th century American and international history, including one on the Great Depression and the coming of World War II. He's led trips for our undergraduate Ashbrook scholars to the battlefields of Europe in World War II. This is a man who really knows the conflict. John, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure. Um, let's start, if you don't mind, by talking about the, the 10 heroes that you have sort of uh, brought to our attention. Folks who won the Medal of Honor uh, and received that medal during World War II, there's 10 of them. If we look at, and we're gonna talk about the particular biographies of these really interesting Americans, but as an opening question, tell us um, the, I, the theme, what connects these soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors? Well, Jeff, uh, first of all, it's worth pointing out that there have been over 3,500 Medals of Honor awarded uh, starting with the Civil War that was first authorized during the Civil War. And in fact, more than half of the Medals of Honor that have been awarded were awarded during the Civil War. 
Uh, there were 473 awarded during the Second World War. And in going through this, these lists, I, I, I wanted to pick out those that I thought were a, a, a cross section, not only of, of, of the country, but of the campaigns that they fought in. Uh, I also wanted to cho choose the ones that I thought had the most interesting, uh, not only backstories, but, but stories during the war. But one clear thing that, that I noticed in looking through these was um, winning a Congressional Medal of, of Honor is, is more, than being, uh, more than being brave, right? Uh, it's more than being an effective soldier in terms of inflicting, uh, inflicting casualties on the enemy, al although you know, most of these, uh, most of the people on this list certainly did that. It's putting one's own life on the line in the service of one's comrades. So that's a clear pattern that you come through here. People who threw themselves on grenades, uh, who even though in, others who even though injured themselves, take the time to pull a, a, a comrade back from the front lines, uh, who say, no, no, I don't want to be, don't treat me yet. I, I, I don't want to be treated until these people uh, who are worse off than I am get treated. Some who simply refuse to be evacuated to uh, to field hospitals. So I, I, that was a that was a very strong theme of the uh, of the people I looked at. Um, I want to also, by the way, encourage folks who are joining us now to join the conversation by sending your questions for John through the Q and A function. We will try to get to as many of those as we can. I know this is re really interesting topic that will spur a lot of questions. We'll try to get to them. If we don't, I always want to apologize in, in advance if we don't get to yours, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Um, John, take a step back before we plunge here into World War II and these Medal of Honor winners. Tell us, you mentioned that the Medal of Honor was begun in the Civil War. Tell us a little bit about the history of the Medal of Honor, how it gets started, what are its, what are its origins, um, I'm struck by the fact that, for example, uh, I, 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 maybe I'm wrong historically, but I, I thought that the Purple Heart predated the Civil War. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but the Medal of Honor then is not yeah. from the founding of our country, no. but during no. the, this cataclysmic e event, the Civil War. Right, right. So, you know, when in the first year of the Civil War, uh, the commanding general of the U.S. Army uh, Lieutenant General Winfield Scott said, "I, you know, I want to propose a battlefield, you know, battlefield decoration for valor." Uh, he wanted to, uh, uh, he, 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 but he was a little bit concerned because medals were so much part of the European tradition; it didn't quite seem uh, seem American in a way. Uh, but then, you know, it, it, then it got adopted by eventually by Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells. And, uh, and so they started being, uh, there, there was in fact a bill before the Congress to promote efficiency. And in fact, the first medals were awarded from the Navy rather than from the Army, because there are different versions of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, they're all awarded by Congress and presented by the President of the United States on behalf of, the, uh, of, of Congress. But there are versions for the Army, versions for the Navy, and versions for the other, uh, uh, for the, uh, other service branches. And, and is it true, is it fair to say that this medal is the highest honor that, yes. that, that the United States bestows? Most definitely, yep. Yeah. Um, take us, tell us your, your first uh, story here. Some, some of the Medal of uh, Honor winners. Yeah, so uh, uh, Jeremy, if you want to bring up the, uh, bring up the, uh, the images. Uh, the first one I've got is uh, Sergeant Jose Calugas who was the first Filipino to win the Medal of Honor. And he was born in 1907. He grew up in a farming community in the Philippines. And when he was 23 years old, he joined the Philippine Scouts, which was a unit. Remember, this is the day when the Philippines were a, a, a colony of the United States. So the United States Army was stationed there, but a, a special unit was created for native Filipinos. Uh, and it was called the Philippine, uh, Philippine Scouts. He was sent to Camp Sill, Oklahoma to train, and then he went back to the Philippines, and he served as an artillery specialist. Now, the day after Pearl Harbor, Japanese forces land in the Philippines. 
the U.S. battle plan at the time was not to contest the landing, but rather to let them land, let the Japanese land, and then establish what were assumed to be better defensive lines farther south. And Galugas was assigned to a gun battery. His job was to carry ammunition to it. But he went above and beyond the call of duty when he noticed that an, an artillery piece a thousand yards away, that the crew had all been killed or wounded. So the guy organized a, a team of volunteers, which ran over to this battery uh, in the all under ha heavy yeah, Japanese fire and got this gun firing again. So for this, he was approved for a, a Medal of Honor in February of 1942. But if you know anything about the history of the fighting in the Philippines, Kalugas and his comrades had bigger things to be concerned about at the time because they were still fighting. Uh, and, uh, and, and now they were, they were bottled up on the Bataan Peninsula. And uh, finally, you know, that, that's, this campaign did not go well. U.S. forces surrendered in early April. About 76,000 Americans and Filipinos went into captivity. Kalugas then, remember, at this point, Kalugas was already regarded as a hero for what he had done in the fighting. But then he becomes part of the Bataan Death March, um, which, which was simply horrid, where these POWs were led with no food or water over a, you know, a, a long hike to get to POW camps. Once he gets to a Japanese prisoner of war camp, the, the less said about what went on in Japanese prisoner of war camps, the better. It, was, it would have been absolutely hellish. Uh, he's starved there. He's subjected to frequent beatings. But then in January 1943, the Japanese let him out and said, okay, you can go work for a rice mill. Well, you know, on the surface, he did that. But he also joined an underground movement of Filipinos that waged a guerrilla war against the Japanese for the rest of the war. And, uh, and once the Philippines were liberated, Kalugas received the, uh, the Medal of Honor, was presented to him at the end of April 1945. After the war, he was assigned to occupation duty on Okinawa. And while he was there, he satisfied all the requirements to become a U.S. citizen. Right? Up until this point, he hadn't been a, a, a citizen. Just because you were in the Philippines, you were born in the Philippines, even though the Philippines was a U.S. colony, that wasn't enough to be, obtain citizenship. But he became one. So he remained in the Army until 1957. He retired with the rank of captain, and he moved to Tacoma, Washington with his family. And he died in 1998, which I was about to say was not too long ago, but actually it was kind of a long time ago. To me, it doesn't seem that long ago. <laughs> did did he ever explain why he as a person who is not then an american citizen would put himself on the line in such a way well he he in a way he felt a connection to america you know it was uh um i, I think most americans had come to the conclusion that imperialism was not was not a great it was not a great thing certainly the experience when the Philippine the Philippines were first colonized was was not a happy one. Many Filipinos resented the fact, but as time went on, I think there were plenty of Filipinos who were uh, who who started to identify with the United States. And certainly, uh, there are exceptions to this. Of course, there were some Filipinos who thought that the Japanese would be better. Um, I think many of them were disabused of that after the Japanese actually took over, but uh, but but there were uh, there were a lot of Filipinos who certainly would have thought that that the United that 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 uh, the United States was was certainly preferable to rule by Imperial Japan, but that, but, that, but of course you know Kalugas joined long before that anybody thought that the Japanese were going were going to invade, so I think there was a combination of general of 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 general. Uh, respect for the United States, but also it was an opportunity for young men. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think of my own, my wife's father, who was an immigrant from the Philippines, and extraordinarily uh, pro-American, mm -hmm. uh, partly because he did experience the Japanese occupation of the Philippines as a young man, but also because of his love for America and its and its principles. But it's very interesting you see that here in in action with with uh, Mr. Kalugas. Yeah. Um, well, it's, take us to another story. This is that's a remarkable one to yeah. me because it's not a, a not a native born American who still do, does this has this amazing act of heroism, not one, but several. Yeah. Well, next? the next one uh, is, is an example of someone who's, who's not only a native born American, but a native American. He was the first American Indian to receive a, a Medal of Honor. And his name was Ernest Childers. He was a second lieutenant. 
He was one of 44,000 Native Americans to join the armed forces, U.S. armed forces in World War II. In fact, many more tried to enlist but were disqualified. Uh, life on, on the reservations was meant grinding poverty. It's still, to, you know, to a considerable extent, the same, not quite as bad today as it used to be. But, but so health kept a lot of them from, uh, from enlisting. It's, it's really remarkable uh, given how Indians were treated by the United States, that so many of them showed a willingness to enlist. But he was born in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma in 1918. He was a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation. Uh, as a child, like many Native Americans, he became an expert hunter. And because he was growing up in poverty, he would tell the story that, that uh, well, I, I, sometimes my parents would only give me one bullet a day and said, what you get is dinner. Uh, so he had to become really good if he if he wanted to uh, to have a meet. That's true. <laughs> uh, but but so you know he 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 became an expert marksman as a result of this. 1937, he enlisted in the National Guard, and his unit of the National Guard was activated as the 45th Infantry Division in 1941, and he participated in the Sicily Campaign in the summer of 1943. Uh, in mid-September, he was part of the force that landed at Salerno in, in, in Italy. And a few days later, his unit faced veteran German troops that held the town of Oliveto. And Childers, at the time, was at a first aid station being treated for a broken foot. I'm not sure how he got that broken foot, but you know, he's at a first aid station. He learned that his battalion was pinned down by enemy machine gun and mortar fire. So while he was here, you know, getting treated, he put together a team of men to find and destroy these German machine gun nests and mortar pits, and one by one, they did it. And, and for that accomplishment, he was presented with the Medal of Honor in April of 1944. By the way, when, when he was presented with it, he was in a military hospital in Naples, recovering from further in injuries that he received at the Battle of Anzio. Uh, uh, Childers also survived the war. He remained in the army till 1965 and retired at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Hmm. That's a remarkable story. And I'm looking here at the picture in front of us and he, it looks like he's get, uh, receiving the Medal of Honor there or receiving it again publicly. You mentioned that he received it in, while he was in um, a field hospital. I, that, the question I had in my mind was, uh, obviously, the soldiers who pass away, the medal is awarded posthumously to their families, I would assume. But the soldiers who, who are alive, like uh, Childers, do they receive it on the battlefield? Do they, do, are they taken specially away from the battlefield to receive it? Or is it just because there must be some time in between yeah. the, the act for which they receive the award and by the time the award gets to them? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not entirely sure. It seems that most of them that I've looked at were not, in fact, uh, were in fact awarded the medal well after some of the award, some of the ceremonies actually took place after the war was over. Um, so yeah, I don't think I have an answer, an answer to your question. Interesting. Who, who's our next award recipient? Uh, Commander George Fleming Davis, of the United States Navy. Davis was uh, Davis was not not a Filipino, but he was born to American parents in uh, in Manila, Philippines in 1911. His father was a civilian employee of the U.S. Navy. And uh, for this reason, he kind of had a natural affinity for naval affairs. And in 1930, Davis entered the U.S. Naval Academy uh, during the 1930s, the peacetime Navy. He rose rapidly through the ranks. Um, he was at Pearl Harbor on, on December 7th, 1941. He was there at Pearl Harbor aboard the USS Oklahoma, one of the battleships that were sunk in that battle. He was a survivor of the sinking, but he didn't win the Medal of Honor for that. Uh, he spent the next several years on the crew of the uh, on the crew of the cruiser USS Honolulu. But in November 1944, he got his first command, the destroyer USS Walk, W-A-L-K-E. Uh, early January 1945, the USS Walk was engaged in amphibious assault operations in Langayan Bay in the Philippines. The Walk suddenly came under attack by four Japanese aircraft. Uh, they were Oscars for those of you who are military history geeks, uh, and they were kamikazes, right? They were coming right at the uh, right at the ship with the intention of slamming into it. 
two of the planes were shot down before they could before they could get there. The third slammed into the aft side or aft port side of the bridge. And of course, he's the commander. He's on the bridge. Uh, Davis soaked in gasoline and almost immediately engulfed in flames. Uh, several sailors put out the fire. He was he was really severely burned. In spite of this, he refused to give up command. He rallied his his crew to keep going. Shot that they shot that last plane out of the uh, out of the sky. Uh, after the fire aboard ship was brought under control, Davis only then did Davis relinquish command. And just a few hours later, he died of his burns. He was uh, he was 33 years old. So this is the first of the instance we have of, of someone being aw awarded it posthumously. And it was awarded, of course, to the parents in that set, in that case. Um, we, he, we don't know, obviously, what he thought about receiving the Medal of Honor, but in, in a situation where it's awarded posthumously to his parents, what do we know about how that happened? What, would, it, would they have been called, for example, to the White House for, or for a ceremony? Would the, would the United States Navy come to them? How does that happen in that kind of a tragic situation? It all depends. There are there there are uh, examples of of it being awarded in all kinds of different circumstances, and I don't know what when in particular uh, uh, this this medal was actually handed over. Who is our next recipient? Staff Sergeant Walter David Ehlers of the U.S. Army. Uh, Ehlers was born in Junction City, Kansas in 1921. He only really enlisted because, uh, uh, because his older brother did so. He kind of idolized his older brother, Roland. Roland signed up in, uh, for the U.S. Army in October 1940. This is at a time when the Army was, was expanding rapidly. Uh, but, but, but Roland was 19. Uh, I'm sorry, Roland was 23. Walt was four years younger, 19, and that was young enough that he needed his parents' permission in order to, uh, in order to enlist. Uh, Walt, because Roland was doing it, Walt really wanted to do it. He went to his, to his father and mother. His father said, yeah, absolutely, this, this is fine. His mother, though, said, I'm going to give my consent on one condition, and it's that you promise that you not only be a soldier, but a Christian soldier. Right? You behave like a Christian. You fight only in, 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 a, in a war that is just. It's hard to imagine a war being more just than the, uh, the, than the Second World War. And you fight in a way that, that, that does honor to your faith as well as to your country. Uh, Walt and his brother went through basic training together. They were both involved in the uh, Operation Torch landings in North Africa in November of 1942. And they were both assigned to the 1st Infantry Division, right? the famous Big Red One. Uh, they fought in North Africa and Sicily. But then in November of 1943, they went back to England to train for the Normandy landings. It was then that Walt and Roland were placed in, in uh, they were separated for the first time. They're placed in, in separate companies. Both of them were part of the force that landed on Omaha Beach on June 6, 1944. Uh, only one of them made it. Uh, Roland was hit by a mortar shell, his, his landing craft was, and he was, and he was killed instantly. Uh, the thing is, Walt didn't learn about this for weeks. It was difficulty getting that information across, certainly to a guy who's fighting at the front lines. In the meantime, in the weeks following the invasion, uh, Walt and his company fought through the hedgerows of Normandy. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to convey to people who have never been to northern France what the hedgerows were actually like. Um, in, in fact, even the even the, even the U.S. Army command had a, had had a poor understanding of what they were like. Thinking that they were just like hedges, like, you know, like boxwoods or something, but they weren't. They're these ancient stands of vegetation that are almost like walls except walls that you could stick a machine gun through and fire out. So these are natural defensive positions. Even if you tried to run a tank into it, the tank might, and, you know, is just as likely to get caught up on the hedgerow as to, as to knock it down. So you had this intense fighting in Normandy going from hedgerow to hedgerow, which the, and the Germans are using these very effectively as defensive positions. But uh, the only way to deal with it was through close combat. 
Uh, and Walt and his and his and his team engaged in this kind of combat for for days, you know, single handedly took out a four man German patrol, uh, a number of, of machine gun met nests and a, and a mortar pit. But then at one point when he saw one of his fellow soldiers lying in a field, uh, this was an automatic rifleman, uh, he was unable to walk because he didn't because he had a leg injury. Walt carried him back to the medic station. But then it was pointed out to him when he got to the medic station that he'd been hit in the back. I mean, in a place that should have killed him. But the most amazing thing happened with his injury. The bullet went into him, bounced off his ribs. It must have hit it an unusual part of the rib, went back out through, his, you know, through the skin of his back, and then ended up in his pack after going through a trench shovel and a photograph of his mother. So, you know, they're, they're, whatever happened to the, you know, what in the world happened to this bullet? He's got two injuries here. Uh, the, the, the single, the two injuries are made by the same bullet. The bullet wasn't even in him. It was in his, it was in his pack. Anyway, he refused to be evacuated to a field hospital. He said, this is just a flesh wound. The medics dressed the wound. He went back to his squad. The guy was wounded again a few weeks later at the Battle of Hurtgen Forest. Uh, and it was on his way back to rejoin his unit that he learned that he had been awarded the Medal of Honor. Uh, and, and he was and, and he actually returned to the United States to receive it. And uh, and then and also what something that came with it was a 30 day leave back in the United States. Uh, but he returned in Europe in time to participate in operations in the Rhine River Valley in March of 1945. He was injured twice more, but he uh, but he did survive the war. So that's really an incredible story. That's amazing. It looks like the picture we've got in front of us is taken after he's received yeah. the medal. Yep. At least one time back in the United States. That's right. So mm. that makes a question in my mind. I'm just thinking about how a guy who uh, goes through that kind of intense combat only learns about receiving the Medal of Honor, as you said, while he's still engaged in, yeah. in combat. How does, how does in, in general, maybe not in this particular case, but in general, how does the medal process work? It would be that someone who was fighting with, with <sighs> would have said, this is an yeah. amazing soldier, an act of great heroism. He might deserve the Medal of Honor. And then a commander sends a, a letter or a note to somebody, and then it gets to Congress. How does that actually work in World War II? Yeah, I would have to guess in this case it would have been somebody in that field hospital that that first uh, that, that first mentioned him, and then there there would have been an official nomination. And you can actually find online the text of the uh, uh, the text of the nominations in many in many cases. Um, you know, that, a funny story about Ehlers was that he at first. Uh, when he first heard that um, uh, that an Ehlers was uh, was was awarded the Medal of Honor, he assumed it was his brother. He didn't know yet that his brother had been killed on uh, you know in on 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 D Day. Wow, and, what, and was it pretty typical? You mentioned that his, Walt and his brother Roland were separated; they were put in separate companies for the invasion, um, even though they had previously been together. Mm -hmm. Is it pretty? Was it pretty typical that you would split apart? I mean, some of our some of our listeners may have seen the movie uh, Saving Private Ryan, for example. Is it pretty typical that brothers would be s separated? Uh, it became typical as a result of the Sullivan brothers, because uh, you had this case of, of of all of these all of these brothers being killed. Um, yeah, the, the, at this point, the that point, the armed forces said, "Look, we're gonna we're not gonna keep them in the same unit, uh, just to make it less likely that you're gonna lose a whole family." Right. Amazing. Yeah. What an amazing story. Yeah. Um, who's next? Uh, Lieutenant Commander Samuel G. Fuqua. Now there were fifteen sailors of the U.S. Navy who were awarded the Medal of Honor for bravery during the attack on Pearl Harbor. Ten of those were awarded posthumously. Uh, Fuqua was one of the five uh, that, uh, uh, that 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 survived. Um, he he was assigned to the USS Arizona as this you know the, probably the most famous of the ships that were at uh, that were at Pearl Harbor. Uh, he was the ship's damage control officer. He was assigned to that in February 1941. Uh, he was born in Ladonia, Missouri in 1899. He had briefly served in the Army in World War I, but in 
but in 1919, he entered the Naval Academy. It'd be interesting to know what he said. Okay, I saw what the Army was like. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list the, I'm gonna listen to the Navy next time. Uh, aboard the, the Arizona, his main task was keeping the ship in battle-ready condition. And when the, when the Japanese attack came on the morning of Sunday, December 7th, he was in the wardroom mess eating breakfast, and he was the one who ordered the sounding of general quarters. You know, most of the guys who were killed aboard the, uh, uh, aboard, uh, the Arizona were asleep below decks when the attack came. Uh, but probably the fact that he was, uh, that he was awake and uh, was, you know, saved his life. Um, he went up to the quarter deck. Almost immediately, he got knocked unconscious from a bomb that hit nearby. And it, he, he had no idea how long he'd been unconscious, but he woke up severely concussed, flames surrounding him. He immediately starts organizing firefighting crews that are using you know, handheld carbon dioxide extinguishers. Uh, finally, you know, once that's taken care of, the, the ship's anti-aircraft guns have been knocked out. The water level is rising. The ship is going down. He was the one who gave the order to abandon ship because, in fact, all of his superior officers were, were, were dead, it turned out. Uh, he, he remained on board. He was the ship's senior surviving officer. He oversaw the evacuation of the crew, and only after the rest of the, 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 rest of the surviving crew got off did he, uh, did he leave the ship. And for his calm and bravery under fire, he was awarded the Medal of Honor in March of 1942. Uh, he continued to see action during the war. He retired in 1953 with the rank of, uh, of rear admiral. This, uh, I was just, I was, his story and, and the fact that he uh, retires with the rank of rear admiral make, raise the, rose the question in my mind, which is the rank of these winners. It's, it's an amazing variety from, from, from sergeants to people who become rear admirals or who are the senior commanding officer of a ship. Have you found that to be true? Yeah, absolutely. They 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 come at all at, at all levels. Uh, you know, probably somewhat less likely to find them at the at at, at the very top, right? If you're a uh, if you're a, a a general, you're going to you know for commanding general, you're probably not not up at the front a whole lot. Um, but but the 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 very senior officers who got awards. It was it was because they found themselves in the thick of the uh, in the thick of the fighting, and Fuqua was a classic example of that. Yeah, and it's remarkable to me that a guy receives this award after this uh, amazing action during during the catastrophic attack on Pearl Harbor, and then as the case with so many other these recipients, it, just because you receive the Medal of Honor doesn't mean you 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 stop serving. You, yeah. He continues to serve and goes back into action again. And exactly and, right. And Walt Ehlers is as you said injured after that uh, wounded many times actually yeah yeah it wasn't a uh, you know it wasn't a get out of the army free card that's certainly not um well i have to know uh, in response to the question that i asked about the process one of our um one of our listeners uh an ashbrook scholar who's actually in the united states marines notes says um that the chain of command would have to approve the nomination process with references and proof of the action so I think that 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 helps to answer my question as you did. Yeah. Yeah. Who who's next? This is amazing. Uh, Sergeant Jose Mendoza Lopez. He was born in Mexico in 1910, orphaned as a young boy. So he went to uh, he went to Texas to live with his uncle. Uh, he, uh, he he became a citizen. He competed as a professional boxer from 1927 to 1934. And after that, he joined the Merchant Marine. In fact, he was aboard a ship, um, aboard a merchant ship, when he learned of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, early 1942, he married his girlfriend, but then he was almost immediately afterward drafted into the U.S. Army. By the way, th um, there's, a, there's a bit of mythology out there that suggests that in the wake of Pearl Harbor, there was so much patriotic fervor that, 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 that most, you know, that, that, that all the men everywhere rushed to enlist. Uh, in fact, about three quarters of those who served in the U.S. Armed Forces in World War II uh, were drafted rather than, <laughs> rather than enlisting. Um, so, you know, Lopez was, uh, Lopez was drafted. Uh, after basic training, he shipped out with the 2nd Infantry Division to England and prepared for the Normandy invasion. Uh, his unit landed the day after, the 2nd Division landed the, the day after D-Day. Uh, he was wounded in the Normandy campaign. 
but he refused to be evacuated. He stayed with his unit. But really what earned him the, uh, the, the Medal of Honor was, uh, was what happened in December uh, when he and, his, he and his unit found itself near the town of Krinkelt, Belgium. Uh, German forces on December 17th, 1944, launched a massive counteroffensive, which we know today as the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, Lopez was facing them with a heavy machine gun, a 50 caliber machine gun on a tripod, and uh, he didn't have anyone else to run it with. Him, right? it, 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 a heavy a 50 caliber machine gun is normally operated by a team of three people. Um, he had to he had to operate it on his own. And that involved repositioning it, on, repositioning it on a number of occasions. This was a really heavy unit. The guy had to have been incredibly strong in order, uh, in order to do this. Uh, but alone with that, that 50 caliber machine gun, he was able to hold off the Germans long enough to allow his company to pull back and establish more defensible positions. Uh, uh, Lopez was presented with the Medal of Honor in June 1945, just after the end of the war in Europe, uh, in Nuremberg, where he was part of the occupying forces. Uh, and then he returned to the United States to a hero's welcome in New York City. Uh, he was also interestingly recognized for bravery by his native country. Uh, he went to, uh, he visited Mexico City and uh, was presented with Mexico's highest military award, La Condecoración del Marito Militar. Uh, but after the war, he had trouble finding a job uh, back in Texas, so he re-enlisted in the Army in 1949. He retired in 1973 at the rank of, uh, of Master Sergeant. Wow, so he had a very long career in, in the U.S. military. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I, 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 again, you mentioned this before, but I'm starting to see this common theme in the stories of someone, uh, the Medal of Honor recipients, sort of performing uh, an amazing, not just an act of bravery, but kind of a, a, a heroic act and remaining calm, particularly under fire. Yeah. Now, yeah. To help us understand that when you're studying these recipients, is there some quality in them that you would have said before, if anybody's going to receive the Medal of Honor, it's sure going to be this guy, Jose Lopez. Or is it, uh, they just show these qualities on the field of battle that you wouldn't necessarily think they have. You know, I, you, when you're inclined to look at Lopez, for instance, and say, well, it, it, this was a tough guy, right? He was a, he was a professional boxer. Um, surely that, that played some role in it. But there are other stories you come up with where, you know, some, somebody who was perfectly ordinary, not a kind of background where you would expect, uh, where you would expect great heroism and, and it just happens. Yeah. So it's, it's, so it's hard to predict. Amazing. I wonder if anyone has done any kind of longitudinal study about uh, uh, say pro boxers and did they make better soldiers? I don't, I don't know. There's almost an intangible quality, right? That's yeah. the that battle will bring out. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Who's next? Uh, First Lieutenant Jack Lummis. Now, there were 27 Marines and sailors who received the Medal of Honor based on action at Iwo Jima. 27. Um, and I just I, I, I only chose this one because I think in many ways he's the most interesting case. Uh, before joining the Marines, Lummis had, had briefly been in the Army Air Corps, uh, but he had failed flight school. Uh, while taxiing his plane, he had clipped a fence with the tip of his wing, and that was enough to get him thrown out. But he was also a professional baseball player. In 1941, he played nine games with the New York Giants. But after the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, he enlisted in the Marine Corps. And because he had gone to college, in fact, he had come close to graduating from uh, from Baylor. He was eligible for officers training school. And after completing officer, officers training uh, uh, school, he was commissioned at a, as a second lieutenant. And he landed on Iwo Jima as part of the first wave on February 19th, 1945. And I don't know how many in our in our audience were really familiar with the nature of the fighting on Iwo Jima. Uh, even by the, the, the horrible standards of combat in the Pacific, Iwo Jima was particularly nasty. Uh, for one thing, there, there wasn't a traditional beach 
right, where you could just sort of dig in, you know, dig into the sand. Uh, there was really volcanic rock and ash. And so those who fought on Iwo Jima said, this, this is, they imagined this is what it would be like fighting in hell, literally. Uh, and the, the earth was, was hot to the touch because the whole, the, the, you know, the whole thing was a, was a dormant volcano. So, uh, you know, he lands here. He's a platoon commander. He was assigned to capture an objective near Katano Point, and he led his men in charging a whole series of enemy pillboxes. Repeatedly, he got hit by shrapnel. At one point, he stepped on a landmine, but still kept going. Uh, he led his unit across 300 yards of Japanese-controlled territory, taking out foxholes and pillboxes and sniper pits as he went. Finally, there was a lull, and he allowed himself to be evacuated to a military hospital. Uh, he took 18 pints of blood, and it still wasn't enough. His injuries were too severe. He died at the age of, uh, age of 29, so was awarded the, uh, uh, the medal posthumously. Wow. You, you, you said that Iwo Jima was particularly a, a, a really hard battleground. And you said, t was it 27 or 37 who were 27, 27 Medal of Honor yeah. recipients? Is that is it fair to say that's probably the highest concentration of Medal uh, of Honor recipients of any one battle in World War Two? Uh, yeah, that is that is fair to say. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know about other wars, but certainly World War II, there were more, uh, more there. And this was a, this was an incredibly costly battle for uh, for U.S. forces, and it has to be said for the Japanese side as well, um, who were essentially wiped out. Uh, it was um, for a, for a tiny fly speck of an island. Uh, there was controversy later. I mean, was this really a necessary target? I don't know if you want to go into that, but but there was some some question over whether. Iwo Jima was worth the cost that it inflicted, but really a nasty battle. Hmm. Um, who's next? Staff Sergeant Vernon McGarity. I see him standing there with looks like Harry. There he Truman. Is. That's Harry Truman, because this is he had just been awarded the uh, uh, the medal at this point. Uh, McGarity was born in rural Tennessee in December of 1921. Uh, he was drafted a week before his 21st birthday. He had just gotten married. Uh, just like Lopez, who we talked a little bit a while ago. Uh, he was assigned to the 393rd Infantry Regiment of the 99th Infantry Division. He ships out for England in September 1944. Uh, his, in November, his unit landed in Le Havre, France, uh, and then moved into Belgium. He was stationed in that same, uh, in that, uh, uh, same town that, uh, that Lopez was, right? Krinkelt, Belgium in December. And that's when German, German forces launched that offensive. He was, uh, he was severely wounded on his face and his legs by enemy artillery. He went to an aid station, but you know, at the aid station, they said, look, we can't really do much. Your wounds are so severe. You need to be evacuated to a field hospital. He said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Just slap some bandages on me. And I want to go back in. So he received extremely basic treatment. He, you know, he went back to the front lines again and again, uh, McGarity put himself in danger, carrying ammunition to his fellow soldiers. At one point, he managed to disable a German tank using a bazooka. And he and his fellow soldiers managed to uh, hold off the Germans for 24 hours, uh, but they were forced to surrender when they ran out of ammunition. And McGarity spent the remainder of the war in a German POW camp, which is why he is awarded it in, uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, by by Truman in December of 1945. I see. And behind Truman, am I right? Behind his right shoulder, is that Dwight Eisenhower? It sure looks like him. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's him. Amazing. Yeah. So the remind our listeners. You mentioned Iwo Jima was such a terrible. Uh, struggle over a small uh, speck of land in the Pacific, but fought to the very last man, to the very last inch. You mentioned before, I think, with uh, Lopez, the, the Battle of the Bulge. Remind our listeners of the ferocity of that battle and its significance, because here it sounds like with McGarity, we've got a similar situation on the Western Front. Yeah, well, uh, it's a point in the war when uh, the Allies were starting to show complacency. Hey, you know what? We landed. We landed in Normandy. We, we we've liberated France. Uh, the Germans have been retreating. Uh, this war is about wrapped up. 
but the Germans were it, Germans massed an incredible amount of of, uh, of of troop strength and military hardware in the Ardennes forest, which was exactly where they launched a major offensive in 1940 that overran France, and uh, and 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 they launched their attack at a time when bad weather made it impossible for planes to to fly, and that was really important because. It, it, the Allies had complete air supremacy at this point, uh, but if you if if you launched an attack when the Allies when planes couldn't get in the air, then you've negated that advantage. Uh, and it was it was done by complete surprise. As I said, some of it was complacency on the on the part of the Allies. The Germans had done a lot of advanced work in in sending uh, uh, soldiers in in U.S. Army uniforms, who, and they spoke perfect English. Uh, who went and caused confusion and, and just like moved signs around so so people didn't, you know, wouldn't know where they were going. Uh, and when the attack hit, it, it was it was initially devastating. Um, but there were pockets of, of of U.S. forces that were able to hold out that kept the Germans from even coming close to obtaining. I mean, the real goal they wanted to get to Antwerp and then cut it and, and, and then and then and then. Uh, separate the British army forces from the U.S. army forces. They didn't come close to achieving that uh, in large part because objectives that they had hoped to capture within the first couple of days remained in U.S. hands. Bastogne is the classic example, right? That, that they wouldn't surrender and, uh, and, 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 and held out until, until the bitter end, until they could be relieved. Yeah, but uh, so it looks like we've got a couple more. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, our next one is Private First Class Sadao S. Munamori, who was the first Japanese American to win the Medal of Honor. Uh, he was one of more than 33,000 Japanese Americans to serve in the U.S. Armed Forces during the war. And, and he enlisted in the Army, uh, in fact, in November of 1941, a, a month before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, Munamori's family, like thousands of other Japanese Americans who lived along the West Coast, were, uh, were sent to an internment camp, Manzanar in California's Sierra Mountains. Uh, but Munamori was, uh, was at the Military Intelligence Services Language School in Minnesota when he learned that uh, a, a new unit was being formed, uh, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, a segregated unit made up of Japanese Americans. And he said, this is, this is what I, this is what I would want to do. I want to join fellow Japanese Americans. We want to show the, uh, show that we are patriotic Americans, despite the fact that, you know, we, that uh, we're of Japanese descent. Uh, Munamori arrived in Italy in 1944. He didn't end up getting into the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, but it turned out that there were so many Japanese Americans who wanted to, uh, to fight in these special units that a second a group was created. This was the 100th Infantry Battalion. Again, a unit made up wholly of Japanese Americans. Uh, in April 1945, Munamori's unit was given orders to assault the final German defensive line in Italy. This was called the Gothic Line, and it stretched across the Apennines Mountains. And the Germans had been making very good defensive use of, uh, of, of the mountains. The, the pace of the advance up through Italy was glacially slow. Uh, well, during the attack, Munamori's squad leader was injured. So it fell to Munamori to take command. Uh, he used grenades to take out a couple of, of, of machine gun nests. And then he and his squad took refuge from enemy fire in a shell crater. While they were in there, he felt something hit his helmet. Well, it was a German grenade, hit his helmet and landed in the midst of the, uh, in the midst of the men. Head starts rolling toward his comrades. Munamori jumped on top of it and, and, and held it down and absorbed the blast. Uh, obviously, he was killed, but he saved every other man in that uh, in that foxhole. Uh, his unit went on to break through the Gothic line. Munamori was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor in March 1946. Wow, that is an amazing story. Um, what, was it at all um, controversial for a Japanese American to receive the award or did his service and him receiving the award have the kind of effect 
that he hoped it would, which is to show <laughs> the public that these these are Americans just like everybody else. Yeah, well, the fact that he was not, he did not receive the award until March of 1946 was specifically because there was some controversy about awarding it to, uh, uh, to someone who was Japanese. You know, once the war ended, then you know, passions cooled a bit and it became uh, it became more acceptable. And in fact, he was not the only Japanese American to receive a uh, uh, to receive a, a Medal of Honor. He's only I thought he was the best story of the group. Yeah. Wow. And a, an amazing story, actually. Um, we have another uh, one more. Yeah. Signalman first class Douglas A. Monroe. He is uh, distinguished as the only member of the U.S. Coast Guard to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. Not, not only the only member of the U.S. Coast Guard during World War II, but the only member of the U.S. Coast Guard ever to receive the Medal of Honor. Uh, Monroe was born in Vancouver, Canada. His mother, in fact, was from England, but at the age of two, he and his family moved to, uh, uh, to Washington State and the whole family became, uh, uh, became citizens. So he attended Central Washington College of Education, but, you know, he, uh, he said, eh, it looks like war is coming. Uh, I'm, you know, he, he left school and he enlisted in the Coast Guard. Um, he participated in what were called neutrality patrols in 1940-41. This is actually kind of a clever thing that Franklin Roosevelt did. Uh, Congress said, absolutely no way uh, should, U should U.S. vessels participate in convoys, in British convoys because right, that's too much like involvement in the war. Uh, well, before too long, there were, in fact, U.S. ships that were protecting British convoys, and people would say, oh, what's going on here? And he said, no, 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 these aren't convoys. These are neutrality patrols. Uh, <laughs> our, our ships are just going out there to, to, de to, to defend U.S. neutrality. We're defending the Western Hemisphere. Uh, another interesting thing, over the course of, of late 1940 and 1941, he kept redefining what the Western Hemisphere <laughs> meant so that, you know, eventually you could justify occupying Iceland on the grounds that it was for the defense of the uh, defense of the Western Hemisphere. So it, increasingly, U.S. ships were going way out into the Atlantic, almost as far as to, to, to the British Isles. Uh, and uh, on the premise that these were that these were neutrality patrols. Anyway, Monroe served on uh, on, a, on a Coast Guard cutter as part of these. But then, uh, after the start of the war, he was assigned to lead a group of of Higgins boats. Right, these were the the boats that were that that were used to land troops uh, at Normandy, but. They were used for all sorts of other operations. Higgins boats were, were in fact built in, uh, in New Orleans and the, uh, the site of the National World War II Museum is in the, the former factory where the Higgins boats were constructed. So September 1942, he's leading a group of Higgins boats that's landing Marines on Guadalcanal. And he, he, they drop off a bunch of them, but immediately they got back to base. Uh, where they learned that, in fact, orders had been garbled. They were not supposed to be dropped off where they were. They're now in a really difficult position. They've got to be pulled out. And, and Monroe says, okay, let's go. So this, this, uh, this group of Higgins, Higgins boats uh, it heads toward shore. Almost immediately, they come under heavy fire from Japanese heavy machine guns on the on the beach. At one point, he's being warned from the from the shore. The Marines on, on shore say, "No, no, it's too dangerous. Back off. We'll handle this." Monroe said, "No, we're gonna not gonna do that." Monroe saw another landing craft uh, that already had a group of Marines on it that got held up on a reef, and it was a. I mean, it was all of the Marines and, and the boat itself. They were sitting ducks for uh, for enemy fire. Uh, so Monroe pulled up his Higgins boat next to it, signaled for the Marines to jump off and swim over to his boat. Well, while they were doing this, uh, he got hit by a bullet in the base of the base of his skull. He managed to stay alive for a little while while the Marines were getting aboard. His last words were, did they get off? And the answer was, yes, they did. And the Marines were eventually carried to uh, carried to safety, but but Monroe himself didn't make it. Uh, one interesting postscript to this story. FDR presented, Franklin Roosevelt presented the medal to his parents, James and Edith Monroe, in May of 1943. 
And just a few hours later, his mother, Edith Monroe, in honor of what, his, what, what her son had done, enlisted in the Coast Guard. Even though she was 43 years old, she went through the basic training and everything. Uh, wow. But, uh, it was a really interesting story. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, uh, 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 I'm sure our listeners, some of them are, are thinking and, and wondering, with your wealth of, of knowledge about World War II and selecting these wonderful stories for us, John, um, what are some books or movies about um, these kind of great hero stories of World War II that you would recommend to our listeners? Hmm. Well, uh, you know, um, Stephen Ambrose has a lot of uh, a lot of fantastic books uh, about uh, about U.S. U.S. Armed Forces at War. Uh, Rick Rick Atkinson has a series uh, one about uh, uh, this. The first, the first in the trilogy is about North Africa. The second about the Italian campaign. The third is uh, is, is France. Um, the, yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the exact names, but uh, but 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 Atkinson is the uh, is the name of the author. Um, in terms of movies, you know, I am not a huge fan of Saving Private Ryan. It's a okay, a pretty good story. And, and the first twenty minutes, I mean, I, I recommend everybody watch the first twenty minutes of Saving Private Ryan as the is the most faithful. Uh, depiction of the Normandy invasion, uh, perhaps perhaps ever. Um, but if you really want to learn about the campaign, watch The Longest Day, which I think is is, is better at the overall history. Um, uh, Midway is a is a is a great movie for understanding uh, that uh, understanding that battle. Uh, Iwo Jima. There are those two movies that Clint Eastwood made, Flags of Our Fathers, and um, is it in Red Line. Uh, no, Thin Red Line was about uh, Guadalcanal, also uh, worth seeing. Um, maybe there's somebody out there who could who can who could post in the chat with the name. There were there were two movies that Clint Eastwood did about uh, Iwo Jima. One was done from the point of point of view of the U.S. forces. That's Flags of Our Fathers. The other was done for the point of view of the Japanese. Equally fascinating. In some ways, the Japanese one is more fascinating because Americans tend to know so little about the uh, about, about the culture of the Japanese army. Um, but I recommend uh, uh, both of those very, uh, very highly. Um, Wonderful. Well, yeah. hey, John, take a step back from these te these 10 heroes, the story. Um, what what's what insight do you get from looking at their lives? What impression do they make on you? Boy. It's just so inspiring, right? The, I don't know, you know, some of the people I mentioned may have been remarkable in some way, right? Someone's a professional baseball player. Okay, most of us will never be that. Most of us will never be professional boxers, but most of them were just, were, were perfectly ordinary people. And when they're, letters from Iwo Jima, thank you for saying that. That's, a, yeah, that's the other one was called. Um, when, when, when their country called, they were there and they went above and beyond the call of duty. I mean, how, how can you not be moved by, uh, by stories like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful reminder for us on this 80th anniversary, the day after the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. John, thanks so much for taking the time to join us and to share these wonderful moving stories of heroes from World War II. Thank you so happy, much. Happy to do it. Thank and you. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us to commemorate this really important anniversary in American history and to reflect for a moment on the sacrifice and the character of those Americans, the greatest generation, as they've been called. And looking at that, uh, we see that there's hope. There's the, they, were, they had the hope and optimism and patriotism of this country, and we always hope here at Ashbrook to continue to promote that, as Ronald Reagan said, an informed patriotism that understands why America is worthy of our affection. So thank you for joining us. We'll be back again in the new year with a, a special webinar on Martin Luther King Day, uh, examining the question of Martin Luther King Jr. and critical race theory, CRT. Hot topic is going to be a really great seminar with Professor Peter Myers, who is an expert on Martin Luther King Jr. So Mark your calendars for Monday, January 17th to join us. In the meantime, I want to wish everybody a, a happy Hanukkah, a, a Merry Christmas, 
and a happy new year. As always, stay healthy, stay hopeful, and stay connected with Ashbrook. Thank you. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our programs, resources, and documents collections at TAH.org or TeachingAmericanHistory.org. And remember that if you are a listener to this and you're not watching this on YouTube, you can go to TAH.org, go to our blog, and find the related blog post for this, which is published on December 8th of 2021. And you can get links to the suggested additional readings and also download the slideshow with the images of the people discussed in the program. Thanks again.